We're ready? Says it's streaming live on YouTube. Well, setting up your meeting for YouTube. So on me, it says you're streaming live. Oh boy. Yeah, I see that too. Yes, we are. Yeah, Sam. Okay. Good? okay, hold on. I need to mute this because it's going to be very disconcerting. Hi, we are live on YouTube. And, and, and yeah, uh, this is the part where I'm just going to shut up <laughs> because I'm the moderator and I am going to let you, um, let you go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to welcome everybody. Thank you for whoever is tuning in and thank you to Serena, Dylan, Matthew, and Cassandra for, you know, agreeing to participate and, and start off the first ever virtual personal projects top four <laughs> um, presentation for 2020. Um, so we're gonna try this out. I, I hope there's a good amount of you tuning in because it is really a beneficial part of this, the process that we go through at St. Thomas where you do get to hear from students who had just finished it. Um, and so many of you have probably had the experience of going in the past grade tens, you may have gotten to see it last year. Uh, grade nines, probably not. So if grade nines are tuning in, this will, this will be an interesting uh, way of seeing it and hearing from the students. Um, but the goal for today is always to just kind of celebrate the kids who have done really well. So amazing for these four, but also to really hear from them about how the project went and why they ultimately were so successful. So what were some of the things that they did that they would recommend to students who are about to start or who have actually started the process and also things that maybe they would avoid if they could go back and avoid it after the fact. So things where they had some stress or they ran into issues. That being said, you're always gonna have your own personal issues that come with the personal project and that's really vital part of the learning process. Uh, you guys have heard me say this, you guys, you four, but also uh, the kids who started it this year in grade 10 have heard me say this too. Part of this process is the process. It's really not the product. The product is wonderful and you four made amazing products, but it's really not the important part. It's, it's really the learning that you go through and really getting a even more solid idea of the type of student you are and how you approach projects and how you approach your tasks as you move forward. So um, I'm gonna pass it over. I'll start with uh, Serena. Uh, and she's gonna give you some, we're gonna get background as to the project and she's gonna talk about some, again, some advice. And then we might just have sort of a, a conversation and answer questions as they come as well. So go ahead, Serena. Awesome. So yeah, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Serena. And uh, my product was uh, this guidebook. Is it backwards or? Yeah, oh no, it's fine. Okay, yeah, it was this guidebook on how to be a book nerd. Uh, and I basically just uh, like reading and being a book nerd is la, like my hobby and one of my big passions. Uh, and I wanted and I've learned so much since I started like entering this world and I wanted to share that with others. And uh, I wanted to do that through this product. Um, and it has like different parts and it's pretty cool, I find. Uh, for me, one of the, the best things about this personal project is that I got to be really proud of what I made. Um, it like the, I, a lot of advice I got from uh, people before me was choose something that you love and uh, that's what I did and like now I can I can look at this and see what I did and what I've done and I'm really proud of it and really glad to have done it. And uh, just to add to what Ms. Carlin said, the like the process is really important because I know my mom right now she's uh, she's getting her certificate in lead leadership something um and uh, she was doing this report and it's the same process the the parts a b c d uh it's the research the planning the doing and the reflecting so this like this process is like it's not going to leave you it's really important and uh it's really useful awesome um okay so that gives you an idea of serena's topic and also why she picked that. So again, that, that point of passion, finding something that you already love and are already committed to and invested in, 
just makes the extension to com committing a, and completing a personal project much easier if you pick something you like. Um, some people don't necessarily have things that they're super passionate about. I think most of you here had stuff that you could sort of just jump with and kind of already had a starting off point. Um, and we'll talk about what advice you would give for somebody who doesn't have that passion after, but let's hear about Cassandra, your initial just kind of topic, your project idea. So I made a group that met once or twice a month and each month focused on a different local or global humanitarian issue. So they learned about it, they took action and helped the issue and then they reflected upon it because it's an IV project. Um, but I, piggybacking off of what Serena said, I started humani doing humanitarian work when I was four. So I've been hugely invested in um, humanitarian what? work for 13 years, which is a long time to do anything, especially if you're 17 now. So it's been a really big part of me and I frequently define myself on the work I've done and the passion I have. And I knew that I wanted to share this passion with others and help them get involved. Um, so that's the inspiration behind my project. Is there something else you'd like me to note on? No? Um, <laughs> um, advice I would give. I'll give one advice because I found Serena gave something. Uh, Going through your project, utilize everything that happens, speed bumps, issues, take those, use it to your advantage, write about it. You'll have a lot of writing to do, you know, just do it and don't, yeah, if something happens, write about it. And I think you guys specifically for who's watching, if, if you're doing your project now, you'll have a lot to write about um, issues. <laughs> I mean, I feel like, like utilize it you literally like it's so perfect for writing about so don't go over that really use it That's yeah I think you're getting at the idea that uh, a big part of what they want to see and what anybody evaluating the person the project wants to see is you overcoming challenges and you what do you do to how do you stay d determined and how do you persevere and how do you do that and so yeah you're totally right in the face of quarantine and pandemic and information changing from day to day is definitely a lot of, you know, material to work with from the standpoint of, of determination and perseverance. Absolutely. hundred um, percent. Even just ideas that kids had and maybe thought they wanted to do for a long time are not doable this year. You know, we've had kids who wanted to organize events, which in the past, we always have like a good chunk of kids. Even your, your group, Cassandra, would, would pose a challenge to try to do it at this point in time, you know? So, so a lot of kids who have had to kind of pivot from this is what I always thought I was gonna do to now, oh my God, how do I still kind of address that same idea and same goal, but without being able to kind of interact in a physical sense with anybody. So that's, that's kind of like a, a really good point that they're gonna have that to work with. If I could just- okay, So we're gonna move to Dylan and Dylan's gonna talk about her project. <laughs> Wait, because what were you saying? I was just going to say, sorry for interrupting, um, just to note on that, like I found with my project, I really didn't know what I was going to do. And I'm that type of person that literally has my whole life planned out, except I couldn't figure out what I was going to do for this project. And I went through a lot of different ideas. So don't settle on the idea that like, just because that sounds like something you can do, do something you're passionate about. And then if it's something that is going to face a lot of issues, because my project did, um, to continue pushing for that. Cause I know at the beginning, my mentor was a bit skeptical about my project because it's not something that's like, I don't know, a traditional personal project in a sense, but like Miss Carlin, you really helped me get it past him and to get it. And I'm like so happy with how it happened, but like just, if you have a really good idea, push for it and like find a way around it because it's like, it makes the product 10 million times better. Okay. Don't yeah. And talk about, talk about a life lesson, right? Like when you believe in something, if you're in a school environment or beyond that, if you're in a work environment and you think an idea is really good, it's super important to continue to stand behind that and say, no, I think there's validity to this. I think it's important. And I really want 
I really want people to understand it. And that doesn't mean that it's not going to need tweaking. That doesn't mean the idea in and of itself needs that support and say, okay, yeah, maybe right now it doesn't make sense. But here, let's just kind of address this or tweak this. And now it's going to work. And now that idea can actually come to fruition. So for sure, 100%. So sorry, Dylan, go ahead. <laughs> um, so for my project, um, I had a bit of a different experience than everyone else. I had like a clear motivation behind mine. So I ended up doing a podcast about the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and how it relates to the world today. Um, I chose that project um, kind of out of spite because it fueled my passion a little bit. I had a bit of an issue with a teacher in the past and she said that it was not an appropriate topic for a classroom to be explored in depth. So I decided for my personal project, I was super interested in it. So I wanted to push myself and actually go that extra step and kind of understand why there was this stigma behind the topic of the AIDS epidemic, why people didn't want to talk about it necessarily even today. And so I looked into this thing and I got super, super interested in it um and i ended up uh sending my podcast to the apple podcast network and it's being filtered right now to be put on the app and stuff that's not the medium i would have chosen at all i i don't like podcasting even as i was doing it i didn't like it um like we did in sec three like the podcast project i detested that so i didn't think that would be the medium i would do my project in i wanted to write um like kind of like an article if anyone's read like um people of new york like just kind of profiles about the aids epidemic and I was talking to my mentor, Mr. Cloney, and he just turns to me, he said, do you really think that the people that you're trying to talk to are going to read a 10 page thing about a really sad topic from a long time ago? And then I was like, yeah, you're right. And he's, this is a key piece of advice that he gave me is when you're doing a personal project that is some kind of a visual medium or something that you read, you have to make sure you know who your audience is, who are you trying to present it to and who do you want to get the message across? I we have that a I question. We have a question from YouTube. How many episodes did you create, Dylan? Um, I only created one episode because it's not a series. It's a documentary. So it was, um, I did a 15 minute documentary because I read a bunch of studies and it came up with the fact that young people don't have an attention span of more than um, 20 minutes when it comes to a very serious topic that might make them uncomfortable. So I tried to keep under that as well as I could and also encapsulate the severity of my project. Um, so I only made one, but that's why it makes it a lot more interesting because if I had had the opportunity to make like six or seven episodes, I could have gotten a lot more covered. So it taught me really about deciding what you want to put into something, uh, quality over quantity, deciding what message you really want to get across and how to get across in an effective way. Um, like I talked about in the 80s, um what happened how it happened why people didn't get treated and also things that you need to know about today like today there are more people living with hiv and aids than there were at the height of the aids epidemic in the 80s which more people don't know about due to the instability of medication in africa um so there are 36.9 million people today living with it whereas the height of the crisis there were 12 million so it really brought me into what i want to do with my life i'm looking a lot into working um adding a business degree or even a law degree to go into humanitarian work so that I can um, get access to medication with the World Health Organization because there are a lot of doctors, sure, but there are not a lot of people petitioning to get access for things like that. So it can really take you on things even further than the project. Like I don't know how to describe it other than that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of kids, you know, I wouldn't say this happens to everybody where it sort of fuels a deeper passion. Um, but there are a good chunk of kids every year who will say, you know, this has kind of led me down to a path. I really feel like having delved into a project of this magnitude on that topic, and I still feel passionate about it, and I still love it. Um, this is something that I do want to maybe use as a career or use as a long-term hobby, right? If it was something, you know, we're going to lead to Matthew in a second, where he's going to talk about music and something that's always been passionate for him. But maybe for some people, they were like, yeah, I, I don't really know what I want to do. Maybe I'm going to do something with painting. And it leads to a now a passion and something that will be a hobby for them. But I do want to yeah. touch on a really important point that you made at the beginning, Dylan, about your audience. Um, so the students right now have had to actually fill out a SMART goal. And so they've had to use that acronym and address certain components of their project and their goal with that in mind. So S being, is it how specific is it? M being measurable. And then the A does talk about who your audience is. And so 
that is super important because again, yeah, if you're trying to get teens or your age group, the 12 to 17 age group in, invested in spending time listening to a podcast on the AIDS epidemic, yeah, are, are they going to really read an article? That's not to say that there aren't some teens who are out there reading articles, absolutely. But for the most part, yeah, you want to reach as many people as you can. And you certainly want to reach the appropriate audience that you're directing this to. So that is an important consideration to continue to go back to throughout the process. Who yeah. is your target audience? And then am I continuing to do that audience justice with my plan and then with my product as I start to undertake it? So audience, yeah. hugely important for sure. And, and Mr. Colony, as you know, a drama English teacher, really definitely going to understand that for my sure. My man, I love him. He's a great mentor. Um, but here's the, just the last thing. By definitely, like I, it has triggered definitely like a, like a huge passion of mine, whether I pursue it in like a career field or not, like it's definitely something that's piqued my interest. That is not to say that your project in any way has to be the deepest, most meaningful thing in your life. It can definitely be something that you've always wanted to try, something that you just haven't had an opportunity to go after before. It's not supposed to just be something that clicks together. It's, an, it's a project in school that's supposed to be it's fun but also um teach you a lot about yourself so just do something definitely do something challenging because if it's not challenging you're gonna have nothing to write about as cassandra said the problems that you come and you face are so much more important and valuable in writing about than this went perfectly this went fine this is amazing it worked out perfect the things that um go wrong are what teach you the most about it so pick something that you know you won't get right off the bat yeah good point for sure absolutely I mean, and then also the problem is if it's not challenging enough, your mentor will tell you you can't do it. <laughs> so it for sure has to be challenging. All right, so we're gonna go to Matthew. Not last, but certainly not least, Matthew. <laughs> if you can give us a little bit of a, a background on your topic and uh, and how you how you selected it. Okay, um, so uh, I made a musical composition between the oboe and the trumpet, and we'll get into why those two instruments. Uh, in a second, but I just want to talk about um, where I got the idea of doing music from. So I have been taking piano lessons for a very decent amount of time now, but we started focusing a lot less on piano, actually a lot more on music theory. And that's where I got this idea for making a composition before, because I've been learning a lot of this theory. I have been playing a few instruments. I've played clarinet since grade three or four. I started the oboe when I entered high school. Um, so we wanted to apply this musical theory that I've had like a huge repertoire of building. And then once you start doing something like this, you realize how what you've learned is practically nothing. You're gonna have to open up this huge vault of a lot more things that you're gonna have to learn about. Um, so why the oboe and the trumpet? And that's where like the challenge kind of comes into my project because these are two instruments that don't really go together. Um, the oboe being a double reed woodwind instrument, which is has a very unique sound, and the trumpet, which kind of overpowers everything. If you um, ever know about the trumpet, it's just very loud and over, just goes over everything. Um, so putting these two together is definitely uh, challenging. It's where a lot of the research is going to have to come in. And I've always loved music, so I thought it was a good idea to choose something like this. Um, so a piece of advice I will give is when I started this, I had very big ambitions for what this is going to be. I was like, I'm going to learn the trumpet, which I've only you know a few notes on. I'm going to write this beautiful song and then I'm going to play it. I'm going to record it. And then I'm just going to, that's how you're going to listen to it. And then you realize that is a lot of things to take on. So maybe keep your, uh, your product goal to be very like, not simple, but not have too many branches. You can't have your goal be learn the trumpet make it uh make a song record the song uh it's just a lot of things that you're gonna have to tackle and it's unachievable in the amount of time that you have um um can i interrupt you for a sec matthew so yeah that leads to right now the grade tens are at the stage of starting their research and so i think one of the aspects of that too is that once you have a variety of parts to it that means that you have to have a fair amount of documented sources and research for those various parts, right? Yes, exactly. So again, because research is such a valid and a valuable and an integral part of this project, and I, I tell you, you guys, I said the same thing and I said it to the tens this year. If you don't have research, you can't pass this project. 
And if you don't have a, a clear enough variety of research to justify any decisions you make, you can't pass this project. So exactly your point of it's wonderful to sort of shoot for the moon and have all these different parts and, and they're all independently important. And so it's important to like really streamline because of the fact that just the research alone would have taken so much time for you to research all of the, the various parts and support that and then actually put it into practice. And so I think that's another part that I cannot emphasize enough and I, I think you guys may agree with me, but correct me if I'm wrong, that that research part is, is so, it takes a lot of time and it has to be really well done. And so in order to do that, you wanna kind of narrow your focus to that sort of main one goal. Serena, you wanna add something? Yeah, the, yeah, just to add on, uh, there are different like kinds of projects. Like my project involved learning how to do something, learning how to make a guidebook. And then that guidebook had to have information like Dylan, like she had to have that information. Uh, so yeah, exactly the content. So for me, there was the research on how to do it. And then the research I needed for the information and the, the research on how to do it should like come in part A. But what I did is for the content, I did it in part C while I was actually making the guidebook. And I would suggest not making the source, not making the bibliography as you go, just put all your sources on one sheet. And then it was like one of my last, one of the last things I did in part C where it was like, I took two different days and it was like six hours for each day where I made all my sources and I made my big bibliography. And yeah. for your... Yeah, sorry, just uh, one more thing. Like for your bibliography, cross-reference as much as possible. Don't go to one source and say, this says that point for now. Go to like three different sources if you can so you can get the best information possible. And then the annotated part of the bibliography is really important because you yourself get to evaluate your own sources and reflect on are they actually reliable? Yeah. And I mean, that's ultimately what we're looking at, right? We're trying to determine and we're trying to assess at this point in time, as you guys are exiting out of high school, your information literacy. Do you know what a valid source is? Do you know how to determine whether a source is valid? And sometimes that's just determining it and, and taking it from a reputable academic source. And it's also that cross-referencing for sure that you, that you refer to, Serena, is that you should never sort of rely 100% solely on the first source you go to, right? And then, I mean, I, I, I don't know if this fits for all of you, but sometimes I always get the question from kids of, can I use YouTube videos, miss? Can I use this? Can I use that? Did any of you, it, were any of you in a situation where you were using those types of sources? I think you were, right, Matthew? Um, yeah. So, that. yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I was using a very technical music software in order to just make it look really nice. And then that itself encountered so many problems where I was looking at video tutorials like one to two times a day, just trying to figure out how to put in a quarter note, which should be something simple, but then you're surprised when you open up this huge software that's used for these people that are composing these humongous pieces with multiple different instruments. Yeah. Yeah, and then did you get, you you went to YouTube videos to kind of walk you through that or? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Just the step-by-step, -step, like these people, um, they might, there's not really like an expert per se on a music software. So that's when you can really, uh, there's not no need for cross-referencing in that term of research. Um, and, but that was a valid form of research as well. And um, speaking on what Serena said about having to do stuff in task three, like this is something that I should have also expected that I'm, when I'm using a music software like this, I should have done my research before starting and not expected it to be as easy as it, as it was not easy, um, expecting yeah. it to be <laughs> No, for sure. And I think um, you, what you end up doing when you do use a YouTube video or something of that sort, you sort of, within your assessment and your evaluation, as Serena mentioned in your annotation, you're going to say the limitations of this is that it may not, this is not necessarily an expert. This is somebody who's just maybe use the software. And so as long as you show that you're understanding that that is a potential limitation, that they may not have any expertise on it, but for the purpose of what I was doing, it helped me. And so yep. therefore I'm using it as a source, absolutely. And so that, that's an important piece is that you get a chance to address that and you get a chance to lay that out for sure. Um, so speaking to like some of the things that you 
feel like you would have you would have or should have done at a different point in time um that that i want to i want to hear from all of you about certain things that you think okay if i could have gone back i would have done it differently but before i go to that it's it's hard sometimes i think to necessarily anticipate what you're going to need to have researched or have done so one of the questions i got is okay miss our annotated bibliography is due in a week but um if i have to research some more can i keep adding to that and of course because you guys all have alluded to some problems and and overcoming things and and sometimes the answer to that is i go to a source and i go to this piece of information and i find a solution especially if you're in a case like matthew where you're using a form of software and so okay and i'm now at the point of this element in the composition and i don't know how to do it so now i'm going to go research that and you could have never anticipated that so research is something that you do a large amount of it at the beginning and you try to think of all of the things that you're going to need to research and you may encounter, but you're not going to. So if you guys could maybe um, speak to a little bit of like, what were some of those things that you found? Oh, wow, I wish I had done this at a different point in time. Um, if, if, that, if that happened to you. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Cassandra. <laughs> Um, I was just like, I was really agreeing with you about the research, like preliminary research and then doing a load of research afterwards, because for myself going into it, I was very focused on the humanitarian aspect of my group and not the running of the group. And also running a group is not like there's a science to it, but at the same time, there's not because the way you're going to do it is different. And the way Serena runs her stuff from mine is different and the way Matt would do it is different. So for myself, I was struggling at the beginning with finding what to research. And as I got a bit deeper into my project, I did research, but as I got a bit deeper, my mentor asked me questions and I was like, oh, like I should know this, but I don't. And then so that triggered researching, uh, which helped a lot. But then each month, the um, topic in which we focused on changed and I didn't have it written out for me like in may i didn't know what i was doing in august because different opportunities came up and there were issues that um took place that stopped me and prevented me from doing things so each month i would have to research information about that topic specifically um for issues that came up that i or what i wish i would have done differently is i think at the beginning think more about um, the structure of the group as by the end of it, I was having them write out, we had a discussion period and a reflection period at each meeting. And at the beginning, I would just have them talk and I'd listen. And then by the end, I'd have them write everything down. But then the issue was that I didn't have for the first meeting or two, the writings of each person's response. So I wish I knew about that before and I was able to make it up because I had friends who were involved in my project and I'm really lucky to have such a good group of friends who are willing to help me in basically no matter which way I needed it. And so they helped a lot, but I wish I knew about that. And yeah, I wish I thought through it a bit more. So do you think that that might be sort of something within um, I think we as teachers and, and us who have done the personal project and guided you guys through it for a few years now, I mean, it changed a couple of years ago, but it's, it's been pretty much the same format for, for four or five years. Um, some of the key areas of issue that we see are, are the journals, which I'll talk a little bit about in a couple of seconds, but also planning. We find that in a general sense of the four sections that make up the project the planning tends to be one of the weaker sections for uh, students across the board um and so i think you know part of it is what you're alluding to cassandra is that you're like i didn't know what i was gonna need to know i didn't know what i was gonna need to do until i got kind of immersed in it and i think we tend to function generally a lot of times of like i gotta get into it i gotta try it and then i'll figure out where my problems are or what i need to address but i do think having some sort of plan and some sort of long-term and short-term goals are beneficial to anything that we're going to pursue, right? It just, it's just to what degree and to what detail we're going to have them. But I do think that that's something that we don't teach you guys as much 
and and you tend to to struggle with that did anybody find no i i had my plan was great and i i i really followed it well or is that something you notice as well serena yeah so uh yeah I, my planning was really weird and also like really helpful to me like it worked for what i was doing uh in before school finished i planned like by the day and broke my product down into like atoms and molecules of what it was so that like every day i and i had something specific to do and i gave myself buffer days where i could like leak into to catch myself if i fell okay and the thing is i really didn't follow that plan at all i took <laughs> i took like the the skeleton of it and and basically followed that like my before and after plan is really different one's a calendar the next one is just a date like two dates and then this is the the big chunk of what i did then uh and so then it's like it, it's kind of like shoot for the moon and if you miss you'll fall among the stars like set yourself up plan for procrastination and then you'll you'll be able to figure something out even if you don't reach that goal mm -hmm. yeah and i mean the best laid plan if you have a fairly detailed plan set out and then you obviously you know have to divert from it at some point everybody does but at least if you had that if you don't have any direction at all then you're just likely to kind of really flounder and i don't think you're going to fall in the stars from what i've seen in the past i think you end up without having that shooting for the moon initially i think you end up kind of really lost if you don't and so the the students that i have typically seen who have been pretty successful like you guys they, you you had a an element of a fairly structured plan. That doesn't mean that you end up following it because things come up, but you do start off with a plan. Um, Cassandra, yeah, and then I'll go to you, Matthew. After, I just to add on quickly. Um, at the beginning, I didn't find that I had a big enough of a plan, but as I went through it, I was constantly planning because my project is essentially just massive plans or big mm -hmm. plans and planning with a whole bunch of different people whether it's an organization or the group itself so like in that sense i couldn't i didn't have time to procrastinate because the meeting would finish one night and the next morning i'd have to contact another person mm -hmm. or like in june i was contacting them in april so like i know from my project which i don't know if anyone's doing anything similar to it but if you are like be prepared to constantly be planning and yeah because when you're doing something that's happening monthly and that it's not necessarily an end goal but it's a monthly goal it requires a lot more of like being on top of it at all times and there's no real time to like fall behind in any way or to yeah you didn't have the luxury of procrastinating and say oh i'll do that in three weeks which no. i think you're right i think that tends to actually be a good thing you know they say the most the most productive people are busy people right and so I think there, there's truth to that saying of that once you're sort of having to do stuff a lot, you're much less likely to say, I can push that, I can push that, right? Matthew, you were gonna say something about plan? Yeah, um, well, first of all, as she was saying about planning being the worst section, I definitely, planning was my worst section. Um, but on the note of just being prepared, it is the summer, no one's expecting you to work on this every single day um so in your schedule definitely give yourself some time to enjoy your summer it might not be in, like the way our summer went i mean um but just you're still going to want to relax it's school free um just make sure you set some deadlines and have yourself planned and also that if this is something that you've never done before you don't necessarily know how you can plan it out like i thought that i would be doing the my uh, composition in drafts i'd have a first draft get some opinions get a second draft and then add in some things but it's really when you're doing music as it goes along because when there's something that you don't like you can't just like leave it there it's got to be like updated constantly yeah and i i think that's important i'll go to you in one sec to end of, of saying like you have to be realistic because if you if you too tightly plan and don't allow for that sort of um, downtime, then people are going to get frustrated and you're going to get irritated and you're going to feel overwhelmed and say, OK, this is just more than I can handle. So absolutely. Always having that balance. You know, one of our learner profiles is being balanced. Right. And so we're hoping through this process again that it, it teaches you a little bit of like I, I recognize the value of that 
and, and how much more that allows me to be productive. Um, but that being said, like, I, I, think, I think one of the things and one of the points you made about you don't necessarily know and it, it's hard to, to ha anticipate, I think what you need to do is, is make sure that you reach out to experts. So this year, one of the recommendations I made was try to find a primary source. So as much as possible, you know, you have 70 odd teachers at St. Thomas alone that have a variety of expertise on, on a various topics. And that might not be necessarily what they teach, right? They just may, you may know that, oh, this teacher I know has, is into carpentry and has done a lot of stuff at, at his home or things like that, that you may have discovered about teachers over the years. So my recommendation is to get that person who you can go to and say like, listen, this is what my project is. What do you think is a realistic timeline? What are some of the things that I'm gonna need to consider that I will have to build into a plan so that I could do that? So, because sometimes going on a website or getting sources that are not uh, primary sources, you don't have that benefit of getting that feedback of these are things that you really need to do if you're gonna build a bench, for example, or if you're gonna compose some music I go to the music teacher and the music teacher gives me some details. So that's really an important thing, if, if at all possible, to try to reach out to somebody that does have that expertise for sure. Go ahead, Dylan, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so I have two things. Um, so first, with the planning comes the schedule. So you're gonna eventually, um, whoever's watching is gonna be asked to make a calendar kind of planning out how your project's supposed to go along. First thing, always make a calendar even if you're like oh i don't know my blah, 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 blah. estimate things always look ahead see because i didn't know how long it was going to take me to write my script um to record to edit so i just gave myself wide estimations and like matthew said put some time aside for yourself you're not going to expect on july 3rd from to july 15th that you're going to work nonstop on your project um i know for instance a few of us went on the europe trip um so I gave myself the two weeks for the Europe trip and then the extra week I was staying and then a few days after because I knew I was going to be jet lagged. Um, me and Cassandra also went to Newfoundland with the girl guides after later that summer. I gave myself time before that to pack, to get ready, and then time after to recover and kind of just get back into my normal routine. Um, so definitely that. But then another thing, as Ms. Carlin said, you should definitely look for someone for advice. The reason that I went to Mr. Cloney is because he is like very good at storytelling anyone that's been in his class you can know that he tells very elaborate stories and he actually goes to like um meets and stuff to tell stories and he's very good at that so i went to him after we did our project in sec three to kind of just get some insight about it um because he really helped me with what um i discovered is a lot harder than it seems writing for storytelling so the way I would write my script ended up being a lot different than how I pictured it because I'm not writing a story. I'm not writing a book. I'm writing something that I have to recite in my own voice. I have to get the cadence down. I have to understand the pattern of words. Um, and just really don't be scared to ask people questions. If you hear something about someone, ask questions because that's how I really did the most of my learning because my initial script is so different from the last one because my initial one I had a huge vocabulary I was listening to like a like and I realized people aren't going to understand what I'm saying if I try and make everything so elaborate so read books that's a huge thing read like those weird help books like the um, I read like uh, screen writing for dummies in order to understand how to properly write for someone to recite words um, ask your teachers if they have any advice about past mentees that they've had Mr. Katz uh, helped me a lot with that um, just be Ask everyone about any questions that you have. Don't try and like pull yourself into a little hole. Like not say like you rely on everyone else for your project, but definitely if you need help, like go out and ask for it. There are so many people there that are willing to help you. It's definitely going to move your project a lot further along than if you just try to do it all yourself. I do have a question from YouTube. Simon Vaillant is asking, just wondering what exactly would be considered a primary source, like an interview, interviewee? Ms. Carlin? Yes, exactly. So that would be somebody who has a, a, an expertise, a knowledge, uh, an array of experience related to that, that subject matter. And so it might be you're doing something science related and you go see Ms. McRae because she has a wealth of knowledge with, with regards to science and chemistry. Um, it might be, as I said, somebody that you just know throughout the years, you have that teacher as, as a teacher and you know that, that that's something that they pursue in their free time. And so they've developed an expertise. 
Um, and, and it might be some, somebody in your extended life. So somebody personally that you know, a parent, a relative, things like that. Even something as simple as you go, going back to my example of like, I'm building a bench and you go to Home Depot and the person who works in that department has a lot of knowledge about the types of wood that you would need and so on and so forth. That's again, going to a primary source who you maybe have the potential of going back to if you run into a problem. And so, yeah, absolutely. That, that's what would constitute a, a primary source. Um, so I wanna shift to journals. I wanna get you guys to possibly give us a little bit of input on your journals and, and how the journals worked out for you. Just to give you context this year because of the nature of our reality that we're living, um, I've moved to sort of essentially ask that everything be done digitally. So all the journals be done through ManageBack. And I've asked that students do journals once a week at the bare minimum. Um, they could be journaling more often if they're at moments in time where they're really, really busy. Um, but they should be engaging with their journals at least once a week. Um, and even if it's just to say, you know, not much going on this week, haven't really um, worked on it this week for these reasons. And that's kind of naturally part of your, your plan. Kind of always speaking to that and keeping that running record of the project so that it's easy to go back to because the selecting of the journal entries is something that I think is still a work in progress for us. And it's something that, you know, we have varying <laughs> degrees of, of success with that. The journals always want to be kind of tied to the four sections of the report. So you want to have journals that talk about coming up with your plan, doing research, which would be investigating. Then you want to have the detailed plan, like the calendar, coming up with my criteria for planning. Then during taking action, when you're really in the, the heart of building or completing, constructing, whatever it happens to be for your product, you're doing that. And then reflecting is sort of some of the things, some of the problems, some of the issues that I had to overcome makes up that fourth section. So if you guys can talk a little bit about journaling and how you found that and what some of the challenges were with that, because I think that's still something that, that a lot of you feel quite challenging. Serena, you want to start? Yeah, so well, one of my big issues for me was like, I could when I was doing the reflecting part, I didn't know my timeline and that's where my process journals really kicked in. And if I had more, I would have like, it would help even more. Um, my, like, I knew people who would write like big, huge paragraphs for their uh, process journals, but like not as often or really big, but really often. Uh, my technique was basically keep it simple, stupid. I just like, this is what I did. This is what I'm gonna do next. This is who I met with. This is what went wrong, what went right. Just basically, line like point by point what is going on and if nothing is going on then like nothing is going on so even almost like in bullet form for simplicity which which is totally fine and that's that's an important point that i probably can't emphasize enough is that the format of the journals in the sense that if you want to write long paragraphs if you want to do bullet points if you want to you know just record links and so on and so forth um you really want to make sure that it that doesn't really matter. The important thing that you want to make sure of is that you're simply engaging and you're simply documenting the process because it's really, really hard in November to go back and say, what was I thinking? What was going on in my head in, in, in you know, August uh, or even May? Because we, you know, right now we are really in the starting phases still in May. And then submission is not until November, even maybe later this year, if things, you know, if things still continue to change, that would be really challenging for you to authentically go back. And because you guys have to integrate it within your report, you have to refer to your journals. It's really hard to, after the fact, try to say, okay, now I got to construct a journal that proves this and justifies this. It's essentially impossible. And then therefore you're going to have and run into problems. Um, Anybody else want to add to journals, Matthew? Okay, so I won't sit here and tell you about journaling because like every, I don't want to say something that everybody's gonna get mad about. Um, what I'll say is that you're gonna want journals and if you don't do them, it will come and bite you because um, a beneficial thing about journals is that they don't count in the word count. 
And that is something that you're going to really struggle with after you write your really long um, report and then it's okay, you're double the word limit. What are you going to do now? It's you're going to want to take things that are essentially useless words that you should don't want to waste in your report. You're going to want them already in a journal that's simply cut like copy paste and it's going to be there. And it's used to support, right? If I can't elaborate in my report because I have my maximum 3,500 words, but I need to elaborate or I need to justify. And so I'm going to say, refer to this journal entry where I essentially elaborate and I essentially go into a bit more detail. It allows you to do that because good point. And I, I'm going to use that Matthew when the next time I talk to the grade tens that you do run into a problem with the word count. And so one way is I can have it in a journal entry where the person can go see that for clarification. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Cassandra. Uh, just to piggyback off of what Serena and Matthew said, uh, your journals are an extremely important, important thing to your project. And I know for myself, I didn't realize they were so important until I was doing it. And I think that's fair to say for a lot of people where like you're doing them and you hear about them and you're like, oh, journaling again. And then you get to the end and you have all these journals and you're like, thank gosh, I did this because now I have all these different, it like opens doors for the ways you can write it and what you can do with your project. And like, I just wanted to say that because I think you don't like, there's such an emphasis on them for a reason. So like, just do yourself a favor and do it now and don't like get caught up in it at the end. Yeah, and I, I love your point of saying like, as you're doing it, you're like, oh my God, I got a journal again. But then you realize months down the road, oh, this is why they constantly ask us about journals. This is why they forced us to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say that nothing that you're being asked to do is just because we want you to do things. It's because it's ultimately gonna come through in the end. There's gonna be clarity at the end that, oh, okay, this is why I had to do this. And this is why this was a step. And this is why this was a component. And this is why it was important. Um, and sometimes, you know, we don't see that until the, the really end. And, and, then, and then there's a, an assessment of, oh, okay, yeah, worthwhile in the end. So journals, I think definitely would fit that, that it's something that feels like an extra, but it is, is really essentially vital. And I, especially, like I said before, because of the length of the project. You know, if this was something that you were assigned, you know, for a month in your class, it's a bit different because it's over the course of nine months, your ability to go back to the beginning is really, really challenging. Yeah, go ahead, Dylan. Um, one thing that I found really interesting is I know you want everything online, right? Um, so what I found uh, really helpful is that I didn't just stick to writing like journals, like typing it out because sometimes I felt that I couldn't get my emotions across properly because I remember a few times I wanted to write journals that really reflected how I was feeling because a huge part of my project was really understanding the the difficulties that came with like the epidemic that happened right so I had to read a lot about very intense subject matter that made me just generally a little bit like depressed and just harder to deal with just understanding like a very tragic thing that happened right so I couldn't always sit down at a computer and super rationally talk out my my ideas because I didn't know how I was feeling myself at the time. So what I did is that personally I made a few videos for reflection. Okay. Um, so I made videos and I was just like, I don't know how to do this, but I've been reading this book and I've just been feeling really sad about it. Here's why I think I'm sad, and then later I reflect on my video. Why was I feeling that way? Um, and it really helped me a lot to specify. Um, just difficulties that I had in the project because I could refer to videos instead of just always words because I found that just watching myself was a lot more um I don't know it was a lot easier to understand way down the line than just typing out like bullet points like that doesn't work for me I need to understand how I was feeling in order to understand what I meant by what I wrote because the intention behind my sentences didn't always make sense in my journal so yeah and I actually to add to that Dylan I think that's a great idea it's not something that's usually commonly done I don't know if it's maybe people feel uncomfortable having videos of themselves but again this isn't going anywhere this is this is really for you and your mentor at the end of the process um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, it's important that you use the medium going back to your statement at, at the beginning of what medium works. I think it's important that you kind of use the medium that works for you. And it, it's absolutely easy to contribute and add that to the system. 
whereby you have videos. It doesn't have to be traditional writing format, absolutely. Um, whatever is authentically you and whatever feels right for you is important for this process. Um, so I think we've kind of like talked a, a good amount of like the key points that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, does anybody want to talk of, like just before we finish up of like the report writing? Matthew started to talk about, you know, word count and length and things like that. Um, maybe, maybe address that a little bit. And if you could give us a final thought of like, was this project this overwhelming project that was really, really just like took over your life and really impossible to do? Would that be sort of what you would say? Or, or was this, was this reasonably doable? And, you know, from anybody who's feeling like maybe a little bit nervous as they're starting off of like, oh my God, I've heard about this for four years and now I feel like the thought of it already overwhelms me. If you can maybe sort of talk a little bit of that now that you guys had sort of, I mean, it, it's not that recent anymore, but are the, the most recent to have finished that? Yeah, go ahead, Serena, you can start. So I'm maybe not the best person for this question because honestly, in the past year, the personal project was one of the easiest things I did. Uh, but like at the beginning it wasn't like the same as like the end a lot of a lot changed in that period but what really helped for me is breaking it down the part a b c d like we were beginning and i was really like confused of like oh wait we're like jumping in 100 percent like and i was i couldn't really orient myself but breaking it down like like the plan I made by molecule by Adam so that I could take it step by step really helped me and see it in like a perspective that was challenging but also manageable. Yeah, for sure. And all of the things you did this year, Serena, you're right. That probably wasn't the most challenging. But uh, but still for sure. Good point of just if we take something that seems large and we break it down into parts and break it down into segments, it's it's totally doable. Uh, Cassandra, you want to add to that? Because yours was, was quite involved in lots of different parts as well. Writing the report never felt like a job to me because I was just so passionate about my project and I still really am. So, I mean, it's difficult to comment on that. The word count was a really big issue for me. I had a lot to say and I always have a lot to say. And uh, that was, the report was not uh, yeah. conducive to that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that kind of felt like a crisis and a half sometimes just because <laughs> like you want to say so many things, but you don't have enough words. Uh, overall, I think like going into the project, I was really unsure about myself, um, which I think made like I was looking at it as a whole instead of in little chunks, as you said, and that's like not a good idea. Just look at it slowly. Um, and then the project overall, it seems like it's going to be impossible. It's not going to be impossible. But if you feel at times like it is, that's okay. Everyone experiences that. Like, like I said, and I think that comes across in how I'm talking. I'm like, I love my project. Like I really loved it. It never felt like a job. I was excited to do it all the time. But early on in May, I broke my foot, which meant I was on crutches for four weeks and then I was in a cast for an extra four um and so that like I went on the Europe trip with my cast on and <laughs> I like I mean like it was fun but it was also very problematic because when you have something that limits the way you live it like, doesn't just have a physical effect on you it has a mental effect so I wasn't in that state and then coming back from that like having an extremely swollen broken foot and then being jet lagged and then getting the cast taken off and like having to rebuild my foot and my leg for like weeks with physiotherapy in that time it definitely felt impossible to do anything because moving to go to the kitchen was a problem so like the point being i was rambling sorry the point <laughs> being like if you're feeling like you're in an impossible situation don't worry because it will come to an end and you'll get through this and like it does end at one point i promise yeah, and it does. I mean, that, that is a good point is like you guys alluded to this throughout of like you're going to run into problems and you're going to run into challenges. And for yours was that a very physical, tangible example of a challenge. Um, and I've, I've, we've had a number of kids over the years. You know, I, I remember um, last year. So a kid who graduated last year, 
she was learning songs on the guitar and she actually got to a point where she had an infection and she couldn't even play the guitar anymore. So you do have situations where that directly impacts the ability to do what you've selected to do, which goes back to the point of if you have a plan, like Serena, Serena had a very detailed plan. If you have a plan in place and then you modify it and you have to deviate from it, you at least can explain what you had to deviate and how you made those changes. And so that that's why having the plan in the first place is really, really important because it shows that that determination and that overcoming a challenge in a very real way. And so so that's that's kind of, again, going to the idea that things are going to come up, problems are going to happen. And so it's important to have a plan, not knowing that, but a plan that I can deviate from and I can explain why and support and justify. So, yeah, absolutely. Dylan, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to touch on this before um, we head out um, soon. I just wanted to say when it comes to the personal product, the problem for me was not necessarily the product, not the fact that we had to reflect and things like that. Um, me, I just don't like structured writing. Like I do much more, I do much better when I'm doing poetry or creative writing than when I'm doing like a response essay. I detest response essays. So like necessarily having a format that we had to follow, like answer every single question in your IB book. That's literally the, the best way to do your report. It's not you being like, this is how I felt, this and then that's what your journals are for. For the report, they have literally all the points. Answer every single bullet. That's what Ms. Carlin will tell you for the whole month of September or, November, or October until you're like, I don't know how to answer this. She's like, look at the question and answer it properly. That's how you answer the question. You don't need to elaborate. You don't need to add a million adjectives to make it all flowery. That's what your journals are for. It's for expanding um, on how you're feeling. But when it comes to the writing, I just didn't like how structured it was. I didn't like that we had to do that. So as Matthew said before, the word count is a huge problem because you're gonna want to, you're gonna want to say more. Like no matter if you don't like writing that much, your word count's gonna go really high, really fast because you're gonna want to explain how you've acted. So a really good way to get around that um, is to one make more journals as you go along like you can make journals about writing your um your final um report that's a perfect journal if you're like i'm feeling this way because i'm frustrated because i want to elaborate on this let me elaborate on that really quickly that could be a whole journal and it doesn't add to the word count that you have to stay within um and then another point that i wanted to bring up is that you guys aren't there yet but i talked to miss carlin about this about criteria you're going to have problems with that later on because your mentor is going to reject every single piece of criteria that you try and give them. They're gonna be like, it's not specific enough. It's too vague. You can't measure that. Because I want it to be like, uh, one of my criteria is my podcast is good. And they're like, how do you measure that? You can't measure that. So my thing was, I want to make sure it's at least 12 and a half minutes. Why is it 12 and a half minutes? And I would elaborate in a journal because according to this research, no, 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 no. I to my annotated bibliography. Everything's connected, guys. You don't just say anything. So I wanted to see if you make as a as a former thing. supervisor, as a former supervisor, I agree with that. Just saying, <laughs> I want this podcast to be good. How how do you measure that? You can't. Yeah. So I decided that I wanted to make sure that every single piece of um, evidence that I gave in my podcast came from at least three academic sources, which was a huge pain, but it worked out in the end. I wanted to make sure um, podcast is good is not something to measure by. Let's say you're doing a dancing project. It's not my dance is good. It's that my dance is this long that it contributes to this many techniques that I have this many, you know what I mean? You have to pull from things that you can actually judge, not just whatever you think. Um, and last thing before I head it over to either Cassandra or Matthew, if you're making something creative, you should make your own rubric because most teachers that are judging your personal project don't know how to judge what you're doing people that only english teachers that have um graded podcasts before knew how to grade mine so i made my own rubric how do you judge if it's a good podcast or not section one is the music does do an effective job to contributing to the text do you think the music doesn't match what's being said do you think the tone is good you know just make a rubric for yourself it'll make it way easier for people evaluating you and it'll allow you to get a better mark yeah, I think a rubric is a great idea to do because it's, it's something that you all have experience looking at. It's something that teachers have experience looking at. So especially when it is something, um, as you said, that's creative. And so that does allow for some flexibility and interpretation, right? 
And so what, what Dylan's getting at and the idea that things have to be measurable and specific, and we talk about that, and we've talked about it a little bit at a superficial level with our SMART goals, but yeah, absolutely. When there's something creative, there's so many different avenues for interpretation that it's really a, a rubric is a great place to go. But for sure, criteria is going to be something that we talk about in our, our sort of upcoming meetings with our mentees about making sure that this is something that somebody who's never seen your project before has no reference point, has not had conversations with you, but they could take your product and they could take your criteria and they would be able to make an ultimate assessment. That's what we're trying to do with the criteria is we're trying to create this, this ability for anybody out there in the world to be able to assess it. 100%. Great point, Dylan. Uh, Cassandra, you've had your hand up, so go ahead. Dylan reminded me of something that I, like before we started, I was like, I have to say this. Um, if you're making, if you're doing a project and you don't literally have something at the end to prove for it. So like Serena had her guidebook, Dylan, you had your podcast, Matthew, you had your song that you can play. I didn't have that to be able to show, like take pictures of everything, everything, everything. Like when I went to do my criteria, cause I was like, this is the part where I can lose a lot of marks if I didn't show it especially because I didn't have anything tangible I went in with my book like it's color coded each mm -hmm. box. like I have my photos I have like each criteria lined out and like just by doing that you make it so much easier on yourself for judging your criteria and then you can use this later on and then also I just like on a note of someone else's project like make sure your criteria can be judged by someone else like you said because like for example I saw someone else getting judged uh, for their criteria on learning a language and the issue was like they said they were going to learn this many numbers and then they learned it but there was no way to prove that what they were doing was the right thing if that makes sense so like if I don't know how to speak Italian but you're telling me you learned the first 10 numbers in Italian like I can't judge you on that because I have no background so be like careful of those things because that could be really tricky yeah that in that case you'd have to have somebody who is who is well versed in Italian be able to judge it and Dylan mentioned that too of like if you choose to say my podcast is going to be 12 minutes long there needs to be every time you come up with a measurable criteria it's not enough to just measure have a criteria that's measurable that could be looked at by an outsider who has no reference point you have to be able to say why so it all has to be tied back to the research, which again is why I say without an exhaustive detailed list of really appropriate sources and research, you cannot pass this project because it comes back in every part of this project is a reference to your research, a reference to your sources. Criteria, it's because this source told me 12 minutes was how long a podcast should be to maintain your audience and to really be able to communicate a message. So all of these things have to be, again, supported throughout through by your research. So research, research, research is so essentially vital. Um, Serena, do you want to add something to that before I go to Matthew? No, I just had a few comments that are kind of unrelated, like just sign off words things. Okay, I'll, I'll pass on to Matthew if he wants to give a little bit of advice about the report and how this maybe project is doable and not something that should be, you know, fear people should be fearful of. Yes, uh, as Ms. Carlin knows uh, how stressed I was. I mean, I, that's how we became very close and you often saw me in her office is because I started off just going asking questions. I was very stressed. Um, and that being said that there are great resources around you to relieve you of the stress it's not hard, there's no reason to be stressed, but go see Ms. Carlin, ask her questions. There is no better expert for the personal project than her. Um, and there, of course, um, there's no reason to be stressed. It's not easy, but it's accomplishable. It's something that uh, everyone is doing. You, you can form a support group with your friends. You can all talk about your stress, you know? Um, it's achievable and I'm sure everyone's gonna produce something great. Oh, that's nice. And, and like, and like Matthew said about stress, like whenever you're committed some, to something and you're invested in something, you're likely to feel stress because you want it to be done well. You want people to receive it in a, in a, in a positive way. And so you're, you're committed to this and therefore there's going to be stress related to it at points in time. 
but that's what life is about. Whenever you're doing something, you're going to feel an element of stress. And I think a good learning experience is to say, how do I address my stress? How do I mitigate the stress? So do I go to my friends who are engaged in a similar process and we talk about it? I go seek out advice from my mentor or teachers in a general sense and things like that. And so that's an important, important learning part as well is like, how do I address when I'm doing something that's large and I'm doing something that I'm committed to? How do I address my stress and, and, and again, find that balance that I referred to at the beginning? So that's a good point. But I think, as Matthew said, it's important to note that this is doable. Everybody is, is set up in a situation where you have ample support to, to reach success and, and to be able to complete this. Yeah. So Serena, yeah, you had a couple of points to say before we go. Yeah. So uh, one, just alluding to what Dylan said, uh, I'd like to say, keep your friends close and your guidebook closer because that guidebook was like literally glued to me throughout any, like any time I worked on my personal project. And uh, just uh, know that to each their own, every aspect of personal project is specific and unique to the person doing it. Whether it's your relationship with your mentor or your summer situation, working on stress management, anything and everything, everyone does it differently. Like we're, we're not, we may not be in the same boat, but we're in the same ocean. So you, you, have a, you have a specific thing and it's to you, but we're all kind of like doing it in our own way. If that yeah, I am. Very good analogy. I love that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And, and hence the title. The t it's perfectly titled in that personal project. It really is an opportunity, which I think is, I, I mean, someone might correct me in their life situation, but for me, it's, it's kind of the one and only time where you're sort of said here, Here's a project that's in the framework that we give you, but you can do whatever you want. And so um, many of us will not have that opportunity in a school situation or even in a work environment to just kind of do what we want. And so I really think, and I wish, and I say this with complete and utter sincerity because I don't know how else to be. I never, I never lie. I never mince words. I'm always really honest. Um, as I say, when you walk into my office, this is an honesty room. Um, that I really wish I had had this opportunity. And I often go through like, what would I do? And what would, would have been something that I would have done if I could go back and be in my 16 year old head. But I didn't have that opportunity and, and I wish I did. And I hope that everybody goes into this with that sort of positive um, frame of mind that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this process and it's, I'm gonna make it as positive I, as I possibly can with the support that is really endlessly out there. Um, so thank you guys so much you know, giving up some of your Friday afternoon when it's beautiful outside um, to spend with, with me and talk about this. And I, I cannot thank you enough. And you guys are lovely and wonderful and amazing. And, uh, and I'm so happy that I, you know, got a chance to have you as a part of this and a, a part of uh, my life at St. Thomas. So thank you. And as the moderator of this group, thank you very much. It was the first time we did a live Zoom for the St. Thomas community. Thank you to everyone who watched our show and hopefully we'll have other events like this coming soon. And this is where I'm gonna end this. Thank you, Madame Mallory.